Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to a wrap up of Leftovers. I've been reading a lot in the last two weeks, but most of what I've been reading has fallen into three categories of stuff that I don't usually talk about in weekly wrap ups because I do other videos about them like Arthur C. Clarke award winners and magazine issues and books that I want to review separately, that sort of thing. So what do I actually have to talk about today? The first one is The Planet Factory by Elizabeth Tasker. This is a non-fiction book currently out in the UK. I think it's actually coming out in the US in November, but I got it from NetGalley and already read it. This is about planetary formation and the search for exoplanets. I think both of these are pretty interesting, but I never tied them together before, but it turns out that planetary formation helps you understand a lot about exoplanets and discovering new and strange and bizarre exoplanets helps you refine planetary formation theories, though a lot of it is sometimes we just don't know but we think we might have a little idea about how it works. This book is not what I would call a beginner level nonfiction work about science. Yeah, it's, it's accessible for a lay audience, but it is very detailed. This is one of the most technically nitty gritty nonfiction books about science I have read, and because of that, some parts of it read a little bit like a textbook, a little bit dry, but sometimes I think that's just gonna happen. There's only so much humor and quirky analogies you can use to lighten the subject matter. Sometimes I prefer just really having the facts. I'm okay with reading a chapter or two that reads like a textbook. I, I actually enjoyed reading some textbooks about science, you know? I think the highest compliment I can give to this book is that it feels like it's always firmly rooted in scientific fact. Tasker does not really stray from just the scientific data and the measurements, and she really acknowledges that sometimes we just don't have enough data or um, accurate enough, precise enough measurements to really be sure. There's a lot of variability, and there's only so much you can interpret or assume from the data without going off on flights of fancy or kind of sensationalizing the entire thing. And if you really only read about exoplanets in popular media, those headlines that tout that scientists have discovered the most Earth-like planet yet, they're really like just an artistic impression and not the reality. <laughs> and I think it is a good principle to stick with the data and not try to build up expectations too much when you just don't have a leg to stand on there. As you can tell, I really enjoyed this book. I wouldn't recommend this as a starting place necessarily if you were completely new to this topic. It is a bit too technical to be jumping in with first, probably read something a bit easier and then come to this, but I'm at that point where I want the more complex technical work so it fit perfectly for what I wanted. Next up is another nonfiction book, Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. In this book, Harari is arguing that Homo sapiens will eventually become what he calls Homo Deus with uh, the technological advances that we have made and what we are incorporating into our lives. We will become something else with all of this technology. And he wants to know what will be top on the human agenda in the future, as we become something else. This book was actually a little bit upsetting, and in fact, almost shocking in some places, because Harari is not handling this subject matter with kid gloves. He's not being precious about these things that we think um, make humans special, that we think make us who we are as individuals. He distills human beings to algorithms and our lives to data processing. He says that essentially religions are the same thing as like capitalism and humanism and liberalism. And that is controversial. I for one am not very religious, but I could see where somebody who is would feel a little attacked by this. There's no malice here, by the way. I don't think that Harari is m intending to be offensive. He's just stripping everything bare to say this is how things actually are, and when you understand that, 
you can actually say something about the future. But you have to strip away some of this pretense that we've built up around those things that are special to us that we think make us special. I'm not sure if the future he paints is supposed to be scary, but it feels rather like a warning because a lot of what he's talking about the past says humans have felt superior. We like to think that we are top dog on the planet and we treat all things that we consider to be inferior to ourselves, especially animals, very badly. So what do we think will happen to us when we are no longer superior? Clearly I've forgotten a lot of the points of this book since I finished it two weeks ago, but I still think about bits of it and it's gonna stick with me for a while. One of my favorite books that I've read recently is Raising the Stones by Sherry S. Tepper. This is the second book in the Arby series that begins with grass, though I think it functions perfectly fine as a standalone. There are some references to things that happen in grass, but they're not essential to understanding the story. They're more like Easter eggs if you feel like reading grass first. Now, I have previously criticized Grass and The Gate to Women's Country by Tepper as being a little bit too black and white, a little bit too essentialist, and not acknowledging middle grounds and shades of gray, and I really felt like Tepper was missing out on some subtlety in her stories because of ignoring those things. So it was incredibly pleasant to start reading this book and feeling like all of these ingredients were working and there really was this fascinating interplay between these varying forces. Like there, there is middle ground here. There's a lot about belief and having the freedom to practice your own religion, to, to live out your own beliefs without interference from other people, but also sometimes acknowledging when when a certain faith or religion or beliefs have, have gone out of control and are harming other people and can you take action then? The series overall is supposed to be about religion, which is something that I didn't realize when I started reading Grass. And I was very frustrated with Grass because I didn't like the religious aspect of it. But when I was reading Grass, I was so much more interested in the ecology of the planet and the alien life there. I thought that that was the focus of the story. But I came into Raising the Stones understanding now that religion is the theme of this series. And I think that was just way more obvious in this book because it was more complicated. It wasn't just one religion, it's like three or four or five. So the heart of this story is Hobbs Land, a planet where human colonists have set up shop. When they first arrived, the very, very few remnants of an alien species were still living there. The aliens died very quickly and basically bequeathed their god to the colonists. And this god has sat in its temple at uh, a human settlement for decades. And the people who live there just kind of take it for granted. And they're like, well, yeah, the aliens said we should take care of it, so we do. We don't really think about it, but we take care of it. And then the god dies. And it just seems natural for the people living there to make a new god. They don't really think about it. They don't really talk about it. But this god is real. It is kind of talking to them, using them, directing them. So initial reaction might be, this is bad. It's like mind control. It's making people do things that they wouldn't otherwise do, and this is bad. And then the other side is, it's not hurting them. It makes them happier. And they're friendlier. They get along. They have fewer disputes. They don't fight. They're more productive. This is good. And it doesn't actually make them do something that is against their nature. So it might be benign. One of the women who lives at the settlement emigrated from a place called Vorstad on another planet. She brought her two young children, her son and her daughter with her to escape her husband and the Vorstad religion. Vorstad is the patriarchy, a patriarchal religion 
distilled down to like male violence. They pretty much worship war and slavery. They consider women to be nothing. They pretty much exclude women from their religion. And so women have been leaving Vorstad. They don't stop them because they think like, well, we don't need you, we don't need wives, we don't need women. So the women are leaving. Then they don't have enough women to have children. So they're trying to get this woman back because she was a very famous female figure in their society and was one of the reasons why a lot of women left. So they want to entice her to come back to Vorstad so they could use her as propaganda, basically. The Vorstad religion conflicts with the Hobbes land gods, conflicts with the other religions in this society, and it all comes down to which will win the the bad, the malignant, the evil, the violent, with the potentially benign and helpful. And then there are other people with different beliefs who get involved as well. It's very complicated to explain and I love that. That's what I loved about it so much. So at the end, it felt almost pitch perfect. It wasn't actually perfect. Bad things happen. People die. Not all of the right choices are made, but Perhaps this is as close as you can reasonably expect to a happy ending in the real world. I really enjoyed it, and I'll have to get my hands on the third and final book in the series and hope that it is just as good. Uh, Memoirs of a Polar Bear by Yoko Tawada. I think this is translated from German. The author is from Japan and now lives in Germany. And I initially thought this was magical realism. I'm not really sure what is magical realism these days. I think a lot of things have that label slapped on and it might not actually be accurate. I think this is actually a surrealist novel because it's it doesn't make sense. It's not internally consistent. It's very contradictory. It's therefore very confusing and I couldn't make heads or tails of what the point was supposed to be when the actual premise of the book that's initially established is upended or contradicted throughout. So the premise is that the, these are the memoirs, the autobiographies of three generations of polar bears who live in human society. And the, the, the abilities of these polar bears kept changing. Can they really speak? No, they can't speak. Oh, they can't communicate in dreams or just, it went back and forth. It was so confusing. I didn't get it at all. I think some of this was supposed to be commentary on the writer, writer's life, publishing, and being an immigrant, being out of your own society or culture. But I really don't know. I don't know. I finished it because it was very short and very easy to read, but it didn't make any sense at all. I don't think it even tried to make any sense and I don't really like that. That is it for me this weekend. I need to go back to bed apparently. I'm having actually a really hard time enunciating a coherent sentence all the way through. It's been a great weekend. I just haven't slept enough. <laughs> so it's gonna be a nightmare to edit, uh, but hopefully you enjoyed it nevertheless. And I will talk to you again in my next video on a better day. And until then, bye.